Hello and welcome to this Toolbox Talk, which will give you an introduction on the key things you need to know when you encounter plants and animals on construction sites. In construction, we have a real opportunity to have a positive impact on the plants and animals, or biodiversity, on construction sites. The simple fact is that working outside on construction sites means that we regularly encounter biodiversity and the things we do from vegetation clearance to the generation of noise can affect plants and animals which might be living there. It's fair to say that some may see dealing with biodiversity issues on site as an annoyance. However, it is in fact a fantastic opportunity to have a positive impact on the environment and communities around us. It's important to remember that in construction, we have the power to improve the environment on site. From a biodiversity perspective, this means leaving the site more biodiverse than it was before works take place. This approach, referred to as biodiversity net gain, is a term used to describe how construction projects can be realised whilst achieving an overall positive impact on biodiversity. Taking a net gain is a great way for a construction project to have a positive impact on the local environment. And from the perspective of working on site, you might be asked to manage impacts to biodiversity using something called the Biodiversity Mitigation Hierarchy. The hierarchy prioritises how you might manage impacts to biodiversity in the following way. Firstly, avoid any impacts in the first place. Then, minimise impacts to biodiversity as much as possible. If this is not possible, then any damage to habitat should be restored or rehabilitated. And as a last resort, destroyed habitat should be offset through the creation of new habitat. Biodiversity needs to be considered by us all because from the humble British hedgehog to the African elephant, many species are in decline. And although it is a shame that we see fewer hedgehogs, it is very important to remember that we do rely on a healthy, biodiverse world to maintain our way of life on planet Earth too. For example, we rely on insects like bees to pollinate the crops we eat, plankton in the ocean for the air we breathe, and the continued supply of timber for the houses we build. In fact, we're only now just starting to put a value on these services, which are often called ecosystem services. For example, it is estimated that the pollination services provided by bees is worth £651 million to the UK economy each year. And the bees do this completely for free. From a construction perspective, biodiversity matters because the chances are on every construction site you are highly likely to encounter a plant or animal at some point. Client expectations are getting higher when it comes to proper management and perhaps most importantly many species have legal protection. Doing the wrong thing can lead you to breaking the law. In the next section we're going to explore some of the more common species you might encounter that have legal protection. In construction we come across a wide range of biodiversity on both green and brownfield sites and particularly if a site has been left undisturbed or derelict for some time. In this section we're going to go through some of the more common species which are legally protected in the UK. This will hopefully help you to identify and know what to do if you find them. Also, as they are legally protected you need to make sure you deal with them in the right way. Failure to do this could lead to legal prosecution. If you ever find what you think is a protected species, then stop work as soon as safe to do so. Report it to the site manager or site ecologist if you have one. Great crested newts are brown or black amphibians that are around 15 centimetres long. Has a large crest on its back and a bright orange belly with black spots. Potentially found in any body of water or surrounding woodland. Hibernates under logs and stones. Nesting birds. All nesting birds are protected by law from disturbance. Bats. All bats and their roosts are protected by law. You are most likely to encounter them during the day when they roost in areas such as the eaves and roofs of buildings or in trees. Reptiles. All reptiles such as lizards and snakes are protected by law. Dormice have golden brown fur, black eyes and a bushy tail and small enough to fit in the palm of your hand. However, they are elusive, and you may be more likely to find one of their characteristic nests, which look like round balls of weaved bark and leaves. They are most commonly found in woodland environments and are legally protected. Badgers. 
it is illegal to injure or kill a badger or damage a badger set. Veteran and protected trees. The site manager should make you aware of any specifically protected trees which exist on site. Specific care should be taken to avoid damage to these trees, such as exclusion zones to protect roots. On most construction sites, it's likely that most of the impacts to biodiversity will have been worked out once work starts. As part of the site setup process, a plan will have been developed, taking into account the biodiversity mitigation hierarchy. If you are in doubt on this, ask your construction manager. If impacts on biodiversity have been identified, then you might be asked to put in place specific measures to avoid or minimise these impacts to biodiversity. For example, putting in place exclusion zones around trees or sensitive areas to prevent damage to biodiversity. Undertaking a two-stage process when clearing vegetation, first cutting to a specified height before complete removal to allow species to find new cover and habitat. Construction of mitigation measures to compensate for the habitat loss. For example, if you are working on a project which requires the removal of a wetland area with great crested newts in it, you may well be involved in the construction of a new wetland habitat to mitigate the loss elsewhere on site. There are some species which you may encounter that can be detrimental to biodiversity or create problems for buildings. These species are commonly referred to as non-native or invasive and often need to be dealt with properly to ensure compliance with the law. The most common ones you might encounter include Japanese knotweed is a fast-growing, clump-forming plant made up of many reddish-purple stems which mature to green with purple flecks. Its heart or shovel-shaped leaves are spaced alternately on stems and it has creamy white-coloured flowers. Japanese knotweed is highly invasive and its roots can cause significant structural damage to buildings. New plants can also sprout from very small pieces of root, making it very hard to get rid of. If you find Japanese knotweed on site, then it is important for it to be cordoned off as soon as possible and dealt with by trained experts to prevent further spread. Himalayan balsam is a tall, up to three meter growing annual. It can be identified by the production of clusters of pink trumpet-shaped flowers. Flowers are followed by seed pods that open explosively when ripe. Leaves are elliptical with jagged edges. Himalayan balsam spreads very quickly and can smother and outcompete other vegetation. If Himalayan balsam is found on site, then a management plan will need to be developed to manage its removal, which will be through mechanical or chemical means. Giant hogweed is a large plant over three metres in height which produces umbrellas of white flowers and has large, jaggedy leaves. Giant hogweed is not considered invasive but can pose a significant hazard to health as its sap can cause significant and painful blistering to the skin on contact. If you need to cut or clear a patch of giant hogweed, it is essential you wear gloves, cover your arms and legs and wear a face mask. Cut plant debris, contaminated tools and clothing are potentially hazardous too. That concludes this introductory toolbox talk on biodiversity. We hope that you have found this video interesting and useful. For more detailed information on biodiversity, please take a look at the additional biodiversity resources on the Supply Chain School website.